So good afternoon all. Um, I'm gonna be uh, continuing on with our spinal cord injury uh, clinical series uh, lectures. Today, we're gonna be talking through the international standards for the neurological classification of spinal cord injury. Uh, this is our INSCI test uh, and or uh, some people refer to it as the ASIA scoring system. ASIA stands for American Spinal Injury Association. So my objectives are uh, to review the revised 2019 uh, version of the INSCI exam, talk about optimal testing for INSCI sensory and motor uh, scores. We'll talk about determining the level of injury and completeness of injury, um, as well as assigning an Asian impairment scale uh, and zone of partial preservation uh, determinations, and then we'll talk about some of the uh, pertinent revisions and expectations for INSCI reporting. So those of you who have not gone through this uh, series before, um, I would uh, recommend that you get onto the uh, Asia uh, website. Uh, so this actually, there's a course available on there. Uh, this one particularly has, has to do with the INSTEP uh, exam. So it's a great opportunity for you to go through with the experts who developed this uh, scoring system and uh, get some practice in as, as you go through there. So we'll start off with the uh, sensory testing. Um, remember that everything that we are comparing sensory for uh, is going to be compared with the face. Uh, and this will be the reference for either light touch or uh, sharp and dull. This is the cheek. Um, and if uh, the sensation of the face is absent, then all der dermatomes below that must be scored as not testable. We also uh, recognize that um, we look for light touch and pinprick sensation at C2, progressing caudally through all 28, yes, all 28 dermatomes on both sides of the body. When a sensory point is unavailable, for example, you have a cast, a splint, over that. Any spot within that dermatome may be used, but uh, you must note that comment uh, in the uh, comment box on the worksheet. So um, sensory testing is uh, zero, one, two, or not testable. Um, now zero is when you have absent sensation. One is altered, it's different than it is at the cheek. And a two is normal compared to the cheek. Not testable is because, again, you're uh, not able to look at that specific dermatome or something along there, or there may be scarring or uh, an absent limb, for example. Um, so in, in terms of uh, classification steps, this is one of the first things that you'll do is to determine the sensory level for both right and left sides. Um, we'll talk about that in just a moment. The sensory exam tools, uh, these are, these are uh, very high priced. You can actually use a, a tapered wisp of cotton or a Q-tip. Uh, you just bring it out a little bit more. You stroke a one centimeter area of the skin at that particular dermatome, starting with the face. Um, if the person does not feel it, uh, then sensation is absent, that's a zero. If uh, it's different than the face, whether it seems uh, more uh, so hyperesthetic or less than the face, then you would uh, mark that as a one sensation impaired. And for normal uh, sensation, comparing it to the face, um, you need to have at least eight out of 10. So if the person tells you, I think it's the same as my face, you test it again uh, at that particular dermatome, um, they're not sure, you need to have at least eight uh, out of the 10 uh, identified by the subject as uh, normal sensation in order to call it a two. Um, again, not testable is listed. If you have a non-spinal cord injury condition present, so for example, you have a um, plexopathy, for example, uh, sensation uh, would be expected to be impaired because of that, but that is a non-spinal cord injury condition. And so you're gonna asterisk the score that you put there for it. Um, and then indicate again in the comment box why you think that uh, non-spinal cord injury condition is present. 
So the other implement that we use is a safety pin. And so we have the sharp point of the safety pin compared to the dull head of the safety pin. Um, you'll touch uh, one time, just uh, the same uh, application as you would do to the face. And if it is not the same as the face, um, <coughs> excuse me, if it's not the same as the face, um, then you're gonna put impaired or uh, they can't distinguish between sharp and dull. That's an important criteria with the pinprick so that uh, if they uh, can feel it, but they can't uh, feel the difference between sharp and dull at that dermatome, then you're gonna list that as zero. Uh, impaired sensation, again, it's either sharper or less sharp than it is on the face, but they can still distinguish sharp from dull. And then two, is a normal sensation. Um, again, list NT if it's not testable. If there's a non-spinal cord injury condition present, then you're gonna list that uh, with an asterisk as you score that. So we're gonna be scoring um, all dermato all 28 dermatomes on the uh, uh, right side of the body and on the left side of the body for both light touch and pinprick uh, scoring as we talked about above, zero is absent, one is altered, and two is normal. NT is non-testable. If you think there's a non-spinal cord injury condition present that is um, giving you a score that you uh, feel is attributed to that non-spinal cord injury condition, you're gonna list that in the comment box. So it's important as well as you're going through this that we especially, uh, we need to be a little bit anal, yes, um, with regard to sensation. Uh, both for light touch and pinprick in the sacral elements, S3, S4, and S5 in particular, uh, S4 and S5. We're also going to be indicating whether the person has deep anal pressure present. Um, a little bit more on that later, but uh, it's important that uh, you, dis you um, do this exam uh, with your rectal exam, that you uh, allow several seconds with finger in place uh, before you move it uh, in order for them to be able to tell you whether it's deep anal pressure or not. You'll note that some folks have spasticity. And so as you move your finger, sometimes it will cause a spasm um, and they will note that there's a spasm present. What you want them to ask or, or to answer, however, is do they feel deep anal pressure? That's different than just experiencing somatonomic dysreflexia or spasticity associated with the test itself. So I'm gonna run through briefly the sensory dermatomes. Uh, so C2 is one centimeter lateral to the occipital uh, protuberance, two centimeters behind the ear. Uh, this is the C2 dermatome. The C3 dermatome is the supraclavicular fossa at the midclavicular line. And C4 is over the AC joint, the acromial uh, clavicular joint. Um, and uh, keep in mind that sometimes C4 uh, can actually go down further on the test, even to the point of what we would usually call a T3 dermatome. More on that uh, to come. So we'll come to C5 in a moment. C6 uh, is the dorsal uh, proximal phalanx of the thumb. So again, dorsal surface, because on the palmar surface, they may have uh, calluses that prevent good sensation. So you wanna be checking again, light touch and pinprick for C6. C7 is the dorsal proximal phalanx of the middle finger, and C8 is for the little finger. <clears throat> so, ah, I've lost my picture. Let's see if it'll come up here. Ah, so sorry about this. Um, the uh, C5 is the radial side of the, uh, the arm. So um, on the thumb side of the arm at about the level of the antecubital fossa, just proximal to the elbow. Um, and then also you have T1, which is uh, uh, the basically proximal to the medial epicondyle uh, on the inside of the arm. And then T2 is at the apex of the axilla. Um, C5, uh, again listed, uh, unfortunately my, fiction, my picture didn't come through. I can't believe that, um, but it happens. So the, uh, the dermatomes for the uh, thoracic uh, levels are at the midclavicular line all the way down. T3 is at the third intercostal space. 
T4 is at the level of the uh, fourth intercostal space, right at the level of the nipple. Uh, T5 is the uh, fifth intercostal space, and T6 is the tip of the xiphoid process. Um, we're going to talk through uh, T10, basically, is the next one that we have a landmark for. So T10 is at the level of the umbilicus. T8 is going to be halfway between T6, that is the, the tip of the xiphoid and the umbilicus, so that's T8. And then T7 is halfway between T6 and T8. T9 is halfway between T8 and T10 as we're looking at, at, at these. Again, these are all on the midclavicular line on the right side, as well as on the left side of the bodies. We're going to be reporting those. Um, T12 is at the uh, midpoint of the inguinal ligament. Um, and then T11 is halfway between T12 and T10 on both sides. So the um, L1 uh, basically is going to lie below the inguinal ligament, uh, halfway between T12 and L2. So L2 is the anterior medial thigh, midway between the medial inguinal ligament and the medial uh, femoral condyle. Um, at the medial femoral condyle is the L3 dermatome. So as we're looking for these, again, we're going to put these on both sides uh, of the body. L4 is uh, just over the medial malleolus. L5 is the dorsal foot at the third metatarsal phalangeal joint. Um, and then S1 is the lateral heel, uh, essentially. S2 is the midpoint uh, of the popliteal fossa. Again, looking at both sides. S3 is over the ischial tuberosity. Um, and then S4 and 5 are in the perianal area, uh, so less than one centimeter lateral to the myocutaneous junction. So that takes us through the sensory dermatomes. All 28 dermatomes are going to be identified each time we do an INSCI examination. Uh, some of the pitfalls that we worry about is misinterpreting the patient's response. Did they truly understand uh, and did they truly feel? And I do try to get them to tell me, are you guessing or do you truly feel that uh, there? Um, pediatric, uh, there's the WE step uh, um, pediatric standards that I encourage you to go through again on the Asia website. Um, so sometimes the age of the patient is going to limit their ability to uh, tell you clearly what they feel because they just don't understand uh, the instructions, for example. Um, again, discourage guessing, uh, recognize that there may be cognitive impairment, particularly with uh, cervical spinal cord injury. Remember, 60% of those folks are going to have a concomitant brain injury. Um, and so uh, sometimes that cognitive impairment will um, impede your ability to get a, a good examination, or there may be underlying, so uh, developmental delay, um, autism spectrum, uh, and um, unfortunately, as people age, uh, they will uh, sometimes develop memory impairments and those types of things, inability to think clearly. Um, there may also be a delayed sensory response, and you're going to have to figure out how to interpret that appropriately. They should respond within, uh, within one second, two seconds uh, at, at the outmost. So uh, then we want to go through the next step is de determining the motor levels for the right and left side. Um, now, the motor level, remember, uh, we'll come back to our uh, uh, muscle grading in a moment. But particularly with spinal cord injury, we don't add pluses and minuses. We simply score at zero, one, two, three, four, or five. I'll come to those on the next page. Um, and we're going to uh, try to find that level that has at least a three, um, a grade three manual muscle test. Uh, and the level just proximal to that needs to be a five uh, or normal. So. Uh, that will be uh, depending upon dermatomes sometimes as we look at the uh, thoracic or higher cervical regions, uh, the sensory levels have to be intact uh, immediately above that. So um, just as a reminder, our motor examination, uh, zero is no visible or palpable contraction for that muscle group, um, that myotome. Um, one is less than full range of motion and, uh, and yet at least trace voluntary contraction of the muscle. 
A manual muscle test uh, score of two means that they, with gravity eliminated, can bring the limb through the full range of motion. Three is that against gravity, they can bring the limb through the full range of motion. And we'll talk through these in a moment. Um, four is full range of motion with some resistance, but not normal strength, that is age and gender matched. And then a five is full range of motion and, and able to provide full resistance that would be age and gender matched. Again, sometimes this is unable to be tested, uh, potentially uh, a limb in a splint, um, a missing limb, for example. Um, and again, you can use the asterisks, but score it as you find it, um, and then indicate in your comment box that there is a non-spinal cord injury condition present. Um, so as we uh, look at these again, we recognize that less than gravity is a two, uh, and anti-gravity means that you're a grade three or above that. So we're going to be filling this out uh, for the five myotomes in the upper extremity on the right, as well as the upper extremities on the left, five myotomes um, uh, in the lower extremity on the right and on the left, and then we're also going to be reporting out voluntary anal contraction. Again, this needs to be after at least several seconds uh, with the finger in, uh, in the uh, anal region. You want to have the person after several seconds uh, try to voluntarily squeeze and you're gonna be looking for other things that they might try to uh, elicit to uh, promote this. So it may be that they can activate spasms uh, in their lower extremities, uh, that they can cause some hip flexion or even gluteal contraction. You want to be able to distinguish this is truly anal sphincter and uh, not one of those others. Uh, so we'll talk through that a little bit more as we get uh, down to that side. Now I'm gonna run through the um, uh, different myotomes that we assess on the upper uh, and lower extremities. Uh, remember, we're gonna be looking at anti-gravity uh, compared to less than anti-gravity strength. So uh, a uh, grade of zero or one is, uh, as you're looking at the uh, C5 elbow flexors, um, you're supporting the person's forearm, observing and palpating the biceps in particular. Uh, instructing the person to try to bend the elbow and bring the hand to their nose. Um, and so you uh, would hope to see at least a flicker of movement here. If you don't see a flicker, it's going to be a zero. If you do see a flicker, but they're not able to bring it through a full range of motion, uh, then that's a one. Uh, remember, they have to be able to take it through the full range of motion in order to grade it as a two. Um, so again, same positioning, supporting the forearm, um, with the shoulder internally rota uh, rotated and adducted, elbow starting at 30 degrees flexion, neutral hand, wrist on the abdomen. Um, and again, you're asking them to bend the elbow, bring the hand to the nose. Um, to give them a, a grade of two, you need to have them go through that full range of motion with gravity eliminated. So a grade three is uh, now they're going to be able to flex the elbow, bend the elbow and bring your hand up to your nose. Uh, this is with the shoulder in a neutral adducted position, the elbow extended, and the forearm supinated. Um, so you're going to support uh, the wrist uh, and then ask them to bend the elbow up, bring your hand to your nose. If they can get it through the full range of motion against gravity, that's at least a three. Um, four is going to be they're able to um, provide some resistance. So now you're gonna have their shoulder in a neutral adducted position with the elbow flexed at 90 degrees, forearm supinated. Um, and again, you're gonna ask them to hold your arm, don't let me move it. And you're gonna to try to move it down into a fully extended position. If it's less than age and gender matched normal strength or full strength, uh, then you could grade that as a, as a four. So a five again is gonna be age and gender matched. Wrist extension, uh, again, we're gonna be eliminating gravity uh, to begin with to tell us about grade zero, one, or two. Um, you're gonna ask them to bend the wrist backwards in this position, um, and they attempt full range of motion with wrist extension. Now recognize that forearm supination and gravity can mimic uh, wrist extension. And so again, you're gonna need to stabilize, support the forearm, 
um, and observe the muscle for movement as you're going through there. Uh, wrist extension of a grade three, you're gonna um, have again, the shoulder in a neutral position, adducted, the elbow extended and uh, the forearm pronated. The wrist is flexed and you're gonna ask them to bend your wrist upwards, lift your fingers towards the ceiling. Um, again, against uh, gravity through the full range of motion would be a three. Um, a four is going to be able to provide resistance. So now you're stabilizing the forearm, pressing the metacarpals down and ask them to hold the wrist up. In other words, don't let me push your wrist down. Um, and you're gonna grade this as a four if they can provide some resistance. A five is age and gender matched normal strength. C7, the elbow extensors. Now this is important that you uh, keep these positions uh, because most folks will abduct their shoulder a little bit and use their biceps and they can extend their elbow. So they are functionally substituting, some people call that cheating, uh, but functionally substituting to be able to extend uh, their elbow. And that's, that's fine, except when you're testing them, you're gonna to need to make sure that their shoulder is internally rotated, adducted, um, and the elbow is 30 uh, degrees flexed forearm over the abdomen. You're gonna ask them to straighten your arm. Um, and usually what I do is I grab hold of the epicondyles on both sides here uh, to make sure, and then I have a finger uh, set uh, at the triceps. So I can tell if they're actually contracting that or not. I'm not allowing them to abduct the shoulder to facilitate functional substitution. I'm not allowing them to supinate um, as they go through this. So with gravity eliminated, if there's no movement, it's a zero. If there's slight movement, but not through the full range of motion, uh, then I'm gonna give them a one. If they can take it through the full range of motion, um, then I'm gonna score that as a two. Uh, a grade three, now again, this is in a lying down position, so we can do all the testing in a bed if, uh, if that's the ideal situation uh, for these uh, testing maneuvers. Now you've got the shoulder neutral, adducted, 90 degrees flexed. So basically they're in this uh, type of a position and you're gonna ask them to straighten your arm. You're supporting their arm at, uh, again, the uh, level of the condyles. Uh, and um, ask them to straighten their arm. So again, if they can get it through the full range of motion, you're gonna score that as a three. Um, in order to score a grade four or five, uh, you're gonna ask them to hold the position uh, with the elbow flexed 45 degrees, shoulder neutral, adducted and 90 degree flexed. Um, supporting the upper arm, uh, you're gonna apply resistance to the distal forearm uh, towards elbow flexion. So, in this situation, I'm gonna be trying to flex their arm. They're gonna be resisting me with extension. If it's uh, less than age and gender matched normal maximal strength, uh, then you're squaring it as a four. Um, you're gonna ask them to hold this position. Don't let me bend your elbow um, as you go through there. So the, the finger flexors, uh, grades zero, one, and two, you're gonna eliminate gravity uh, by having the elbow extended, uh, neutral and the wrist neutral. MCP and PIP joints are stabilized in extension. And now you're gonna ask them to bend the tip of the middle finger. So uh, the middle finger is the key um, myotome that we're looking at as we do this. If they're able to go through the full range of motion um, with gravity eliminated, you're gonna score that a two. If it's less than full range of motion, it's gonna be a one. And if there's not even a flicker, uh, then you're gonna score it as a zero. Um, uh, now grade three, um, again, you're gonna have them in a wrist neutral MCP, PIP uh, joints are stabilized in extension. You're gonna ask them to bend the tip of the middle finger and if they can get it through the full range of motion against gravity, that doesn't weigh a lot, mind you, but that's uh, scored as a three. Um, and then in order to uh, give them a score of four or five, um, now you're going to have them in this, uh, position basically two hand grasp, stabilizing the wrist, PIP and MCP joints, applying uh, pressure to the distal phalanx. And you're gonna ask them, I'm gonna uh, bend the tip of your middle finger in this position, don't let me move it. And so you're trying to 
push them into an extended position as you go through. Again, grade four is against resistance, but less than expected age and gender matched normal strength, which would be a five. And then finally, the uh, finger AB ductors, uh, again, eliminating gravity. You're gonna ask them to move finger away from your ring finger or spread your fingers apart. Um, so the key uh, muscle group here is the abductor digiti minimi. Um, and again, with gravity eliminated, uh, you wanna see if they can move it through the full range of motion. Uh, if it's not the full range of motion, there's a flicker of movement. You can see the ADM uh, uh, contracting just a bit. You would score a one. Um, and if they're not able to activate that at all, you're gonna score it as a zero. So uh, as you look for a grade three, uh, essentially I'm gonna turn their, their hand up like this and ask them to um, move the little finger away from the ring finger, spread the uh, fingers apart. This is just against anti-gravity. The little finger doesn't weigh much. And so uh, if it's truly there, they would be able to get that through the full range of motion. Um, if you're wanting to score a four or a five, uh, the individual would, uh, you're gonna start them with the wrist neutral, two hand grasp, stabilizing the wrist and MCP joints, preventing hyperextension, and then applying distal pressure to the abducted little finger. So you're gonna be trying to force it into adduction uh, that is towards the uh, ring finger. So uh, your instructions to your subject, hold your little finger away from your ring finger, don't let me push it in. And they're gonna to try to resist your force. So. Um, Four is uh, able to do it against resistance, but not quite age and gender match normal strength. Five is age and gender match normal. So now we're gonna jump down to the lower extremity myotomes, uh, starting with the L2 hip flexors. Um, again, you're gonna be putting the person into a grade two gravity eliminated position. So you rotate uh, the hip outwards uh, and uh, you want the knee lying out to the sides. Uh, you're gonna ask them to move your knee out to the side uh, from this position. Um, if you uh, don't see even a flicker of hip flexors, uh, you're gonna score it as a zero. If they can't get it through the full range of motion with gravity, uh, gravity eliminated, you're gonna score it as a one. A two, um, again, you're gonna be uh, putting the person in that grade two gravity eliminated position um, with the uh, hip externally rotated, 45 degrees flexed, knee flexed uh, 90 degrees, um, and ask them to move your knee out to the side. So if they can go through the full range of motion um, with gravity el eliminated, you're gonna score this as a two. Um, a grade three is going to be able to uh, move it up uh, through full range of motion. Um, and a four is with uh, resistance. You're gonna ask them to hold your knee in this position. Don't let me push it down. Um, if uh, they can provide some resistance, but it's not age and uh, gender normal, you scored a four. Uh, if they can do it and it's age and gender normal strength, then you're scored as a five. So the knee extensors are the L3 myotomes. Um, so again, you're gonna start this uh, in an anti-gravity uh, I'm sorry, in a position that is not anti-gravity. Let me go back one. Um, and so uh, with gravity eliminated, you're gonna ask them to straighten their knee. Um, if they can straighten their knee uh, uh, through the full range of motion, you're gonna score it a two, but if they can't, um, then you're gonna score it as a one. If there's not even a flicker of quadriceps knee extensors, you're gonna score it as a zero. Um, so, uh, Again, grade two, I'm gonna move forward the interest of time. Uh, for a grade three, you're going to actually put your arm uh, underneath the leg that you're testing um, and brace it on the opposite leg um, and ask them to straighten the knee out, see if they can bring it through from a 30 degree flexed position. You want them to straighten it out. Uh, and uh, in order to give it a grade three, they have to get it completely straight uh, from that uh, initial position. Uh, grades four and five, essentially you're gonna ask them to resist. So ask them to hold the extended position uh, when you have the knee flexed at about 15 degrees. Um, if they can provide some resistance, but it's not age and normal 
uh, gender match, you're scored as a four. If it is a gen gender match, normal strength, you scored as a five. Ankle dorsiflexors, again, eliminate gravity at first. Um, so have them uh, with the um, hip at a, a 45 degree uh, flexed position. The knee is flexed and the ankle is in a full plantar flexed uh, position. Ask them to lift the toes up towards the head, allowing the ankle to bend, okay? Now what you're actually looking at here is your uh, dorsiflexors. Uh, so you're gonna wanna look where your tibialis anterior is making sure that they're not just using, sometimes you can activate uh, EHL and not the dorsiflexors and it'll take you through that. Uh, but the bottom line is with gravity eliminated, you scored a zero if there's no movement, one if there's a flicker of movement, but with gravity eliminated, they can't bring it through the full range of motion, uh, you score that uh, as a one. Two is they can move it through the full range of motion, um, and again, gravity is eliminated. Now, ankle dorsiflexion, again, can be mimicked by the extensor halicus longus, so keep that in mind as you're scoring these. To go to a grade three, you want them to basically have the ankle in full plantar flex position, knee slightly flexed, um, and you just want them to bend the ankle um, so that the foot and toes go up towards the head. It's gotta go through the full range of motion in order to call it a grade three. Grade four and five, now you can have them uh, start in a dorsiflexed position and uh, you tell them to hold your ankle in this position, don't let me push down. So a grade four is resistance, but not what you would expect for age and gender matched. If they can uh, do age and gender match strength, you score it as a five. EHL uh, is the L5 myotome. Um, so again, uh, with gravity eliminated, you're gonna ask them to move their big toe upwards towards the knee. Um, and score at a one if there's a flicker, but not through the full range of motion, um, and zero if you don't see any movement of the great toe. Um, so uh, grade two, basically they can move the toe through its full range of motion uh, towards the knee with gravity eliminated at a grade three. They can lift the big toe upwards towards the knee um, against gravity. Uh, and then you're gonna look at um, a grade four is against resistance, but not quite what you would expect for age and gender matched, that you would score a five. Plantar flexors, this gets a little tricky. So uh, this is one of those areas that, that we do miss sometimes. You've got the knee flexed 90 degrees, uh, the leg is turned outward, um, and you're asking the person to point your toes downward like a ballet dancer. Uh, so again, you've eliminated gravity um, and you're gonna be asking them to basically uh, plantar flex. Uh, so if they can't go through the full range of motion, you score a one. If they don't even have a flicker of movement, you score a zero. Um, if they can take it through the full range of motion, uh, of plantar flexion, you're gonna score a two, that is with gravity eliminated. To get a three, uh, you have to have them go against gravity. So now what you do is you put, have their, their heel down on the bed. You've got your hand um, supporting uh, just under the metatarsal heads there. And you ask them to push your foot down into my hand and lift your heel off, off of the bed. Um, so this is for a grade three uh, strength. Uh, for grade four, they can provide against some resistance. Uh, so now you... Um, have them in a fully plantar flex position, and you're trying to dorsiflex the ankle. Uh, you're gonna score it up four if uh, they have some resistance, but not age and gender matched. Age and gender matched resistance would be uh, a score of five. So common pitfalls, um, again, uh, pediatrics a little bit different. Uh, you need to discourage them guessing. Uh, cognitive impairment can sometimes play a role here. Uh, and then lack of experience, not by the subject or patient, but by the examiner uh, and improper positioning and stabilization. So um, making sure that you are, if you feel like uh, you've got a score of one on a muscle, make sure that you're palpating and or visibly seeing that muscle move. Um, and you need to know what their passive range of motion is. Uh, so if they, we'll talk about, um, you know, complete uh, range of motion, or if it's limited by um, some position, a contracture or something like that, we'll talk about when you can use that. 
don't use, for spinal cord injury, don't use pluses and minuses. It either is or it isn't. It's just absolute. Um, muscles that you can test uh, for specific myotomes, uh, and I have those listed here. These are non-key muscles, uh, but they tie along with uh, what we've learned before for both upper extremity and lower extremities. I'm not going to go into these in detail, but recognize if, for example, um, a, uh, a muscle is uh, limited for whatever reason, uh, you could test the non-key muscles of the same myotomes to give you your answers as you're going through there. So as we get down to the sacral elements, particularly S4 and S5, we're looking for noon sign. Noon uh, means no anal contraction, a zero for light touch on the right, zero for pinprick on the, on the right, zero for light touch on the left, zero for pinprick um, on the left, and no deep anal pressure. That would be an N. So this is the noon sign. If that's present, your injury is complete. Um, and so that's a key thing there. Um, so common pitfalls with this, uh, again, we've talked about uh, pediatrics and, and guessing, uh, cognitive impairments for a very tense patient uh, sometimes can make this a difficult part of the exam to score. Um, be careful that you're not inappropriately listing reflex contractions. So if you move your finger during the uh, rectal exam, um, that can cause reflex contraction of the anal sphincter. Um, recognize that they can use intra-abdominal pressure to uh, make it appear uh, that the sphincter is contracting. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just gonna move forward as we're going through here. So steps in the classification uh, for scoring, determining the sensory levels for right and left sides. Um, so again, uh, we are looking, a maximal score is gonna be 56 for light touch and 56 for pinprick. That's 28 dermatomes um, on, uh, on that side of the body uh, so that you have basically uh, on the right side or the left side, a total score of 56 available or a total light touch score of 112 points, pinprick score 112 points. Um, and then you're gonna indicate if that dermatome is not tested. So uh, as you put these together, you have your light touch on the uh, right, you have your light touch on the left, and then you're gonna have your light touch total listed out here on the uh, scoring sheet. Uh, you're gonna have the um, basically pinprick on the right, pinprick on the left listed here, and then your total pinprick score up to 112. If you have more than 112, something didn't add up right. Um, after you've got your sensory level, you're going to determine your motor level for the right uh, and left sides. Um, and again, uh, we'll, we'll go through this specifically on the upper extremities, lower extremities. Uh, you're gonna have scores and subscores that you're gonna be reporting out here. You can only have up to 25 upper extremity right side motor uh, points and 25 lower extremity right sided points. Similarly on the left, up to 25 points in the upper extremity, uh, 25 points on the lower extremity. So you're gonna then add these up, upper extremity on the right, upper extremity on the left is gonna give you your upper extremity motor total score. Um, and uh, you've got your uh, left-sided uh, um, scores as well, so that you have your total motor score uh, as you're going through there. Once you've determined um, your, uh, your sensory and motor levels, uh, then you're gonna determine your neurological level. So this refers to the most caudal segment of the cord um, where you've got at least anti-gravity strength uh, and sensation is normal. That's your neurological level of injury. Um, so you're gonna put that down for the right side, the left side uh, for both sensory and motor scores. Your neurological level of injury is going to be the last um, uh, level coming down where everything is normal and or anti-gravity. So we'll, we'll have some opportunities to look through this. So your sensory level, again, most caudal, innervated, that is uh, at least a, a grade two dermatome for both light touch and pinprick. Um, 
Your motor level is going to be the most caudal normally innervated. That is at least anti-gravity uh, strength myotome, provided the key muscles uh, immediately above that are grade five, or the dermatomes um, in those cases are normal. Uh, they have to be at least A2 uh, as you go through there. So that will tell you the neurological level of injury is the most rostral of all normal sensory and motor levels. Oh, I'm, I'm missing out some of my uh, forms here. So complete or incomplete injury comes down to the sacral elements. Um, so again, at the S4 level, you're looking along here. If you have anything other than noon, that is a no, zero, 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 no, uh, then you have an incomplete injury. Okay, um, and we'll talk through that more in a moment. So complete injury is absence of sensory and motor function in the S4 uh, and 5 dermatomes. Um, you're going to call it incomplete if it's anything less than noon. So that implies that you have uh, sacral sparing. Motor incomplete. Uh, so if you have uh, sacral sparing, so voluntary anal contraction is present, then you're going to be listing that uh, as well. <clears throat> so determining the Asian impairment scale, remember that's the American Spinal Injury Association impairment scale. So I will ask you on rounds, for example, um, what is uh, uh, your person's spinal cord injury? You will tell me the level of injury, and then the completeness is going to be Asian impairment scale A through E as you're going through there. So if uh, their injury is complete, then it's going to be Asian impairment scale A. If it is not complete, um, then you want to know, is it motor complete? Um, and so if it is motor complete, that is, you don't have any motor function spared below the level of the injury, you're going to call an Asian impairment scale B. Um, if it's not motor complete, then you want to report out based on the total number of um, uh, myotomes that are great, greater than anti-gravity or less than anti-gravity. So if the majority of muscles below the level of the injury are less than anti-gravity strength, you'll call an Asian pyramid scale C. If the majority of muscle groups below the level of the injury are greater than anti-gravity, you call it Asian pyramid scale D. Um, if you have sensation and motor function that is normal in all segments, then you call it Asia impairment scale E. Now, why would I do that, Dr. Gator? Uh, because recognize that these folks are still likely going to have um, disinhibition of their inhibitory inputs to the reflex arcs. What does that mean? Um, they are likely to have spasticity, uh, which is velocity dependent tone, hyperreflexia. Um, if they have that, even though motor and sensory function are normal below the level of the injury, um, they are likely to have uh, problems with gait, um, as well as having problems with detrusor sphincter dysinergia and uh, so neurogenic bladder, neurogenic bowel, even though it appears that uh, motor and sensory segments are normal as they're going through there. So <clears throat> we determine if there's sacral sparing. Um, if there's not, uh, then we call it a complete Asian impairment scale A. Um, and uh, then we're gonna run through these different levels. So you all know these. Uh, so I think what I wanna do at this point is to jump through, oh, and then finally zone of partial preservation. So let me just explain. Previously, this was reported out if the person had a complete spinal cord injury. As of 2019, um, a zone of partial preservation includes incomplete spinal cord injury. Uh, you report it uh, if there is absent voluntary anal contraction, you'll call out a motor zone of partial preservation. If uh, the um, sensory level, uh, absent deep anal pressure, uh, S4, S5, L, L, light touch and pinprick um, are all absent, then you can report out the sensory level. But if the voluntary anal contraction is present, you don't score the motor zone partial preservation. If deep anal pressure is present, uh, then you don't score sensory uh, zone of partial preservation. So we've talked through these uh, a little bit. I wanna run through at least a couple of samples. Um, and I know I've got a couple of our residents on. 
Um, and so I'm gonna ask folks to volunteer. Um, ideally, uh, these would be PGY2s who are either on or have been through the uh, spinal cord rotation. Um, and so let's start off with case one. Um, I'll say this, that the cases get more difficult as we continue. So um, since you're gonna be asked to volunteer, I would encourage you to volunteer sooner rather than later because the cases get more difficult as you go through there. So case one, do I have a volunteer? This is the easiest case. Anyone? Then I gotta call you out uh, if you're not gonna volunteer. <clears throat> Dr. Kunit, <clears throat> can I have you? I was about here? to volunteer. <laughs> of course you were. So, uh, so help me through on this one. Um, Remind me of the steps as we're going through. This is case one. Um, and just tell me what you see about sensory levels and then motor levels. I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this. Okay. So your um, sensory level, you're going to call. Okay, so looking at, sorry, would you mind muting yours? Would you mind? If you could mute yours because then I don't want to get feedback. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So looking at sensory, so on for C2, C3, C4, um, C5, C6, looks like they're all twos. So it looks like they're intact. Okay. And then on, on the going, right. Pardon. On the right and the left. And on the Except, left. Yeah. Right okay. on the left. So you're going to call right. the sensory level on the right and left. What level? Um, C, uh, C6. 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 Okay. Good. Now tell me about C, the. Oh, uh, but now the C6, I see that there are six sensors. Pardon me. I'll, I'll let you just continue. The motor function. Okay. Sorry, it's cutting in and out. And then for C5 on the left, it, it's full. And then on the left, um, sorry, on the left and the right, it's both five, so the motor is intact. And then C6 on the left and right is four, so you have some reduced muscle strength there. And then C7 on the left and the right, it's one, so you're just having a little bit of flickering motion, so it's not intact at C7. So, what is your uh, motor level of injury on the right? So, C six and above would be considered okay, but then below C6, now you're having, you're, you're less than, um, you're less than three. Okay. So your motor level on the right? On the right, you'd be C6. And on the left? Uh, same. Okay. Your neurological level of injury, where is the last normal uh, area? Looks like C6 would be the last normal area. Okay. Um, and uh, would you say this is a complete or incomplete injury? Um, complete because you have the noon sign. Okay. And so you're going to call Asia impairment scale? A. A. All righty. And tell me about zone of partial preservation. Um, so that part, I've, I've missed a little bit of that part. So I might need your guidance on the zone of partial preservation. Okay. Do you have any sensory function below to, well, first off, do you have uh, a uh, deep anal pressure present? No. Okay. So then you could list out a sensory uh, level of zone of partial pres preservation. Where do you have a level that is less than normal? Um, well, it's pretty much all or nothing. So, okay. so for sensory, it's intact at C6, and then below that, it's zero. Okay, so we can put C6 on both right and left for sensory. What about uh -huh. motor? What about motor? For motor, um, you're pretty good at till C6, and then after C6, you're, you're less than three. So C7 and below, you're, you're not intact. Okay, so what is your... Uh, zone of partial preservation. Do you have any motor function uh, below C6? You have a little bit of motion at C7, but then after that, no, none. Okay, so, so we could say the motor uh, zone of partial preservation is C7. Is that right? Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, 
So this is what you ended up with. Strong work. Now you get to hand off the baton to one of your colleagues Yay. and you get to choose which one. Okay, let me let me sneak through. Eric, are you comfortable doing yeah, that? Okay. okay. I'm gonna All hand that? it off to I'm gonna hand it out to Eric. All righty. Eric, welcome to case two. It's good to be here in case yes. two. So uh, talk right. me through what so, you're seeing. Here. Um, I guess we'll start from sensory. So sensory, we have twos from C2, three on both the right and the left, um, but it goes down to C4 on the left with um, twos. So on the right, I will say sensories intact up to C3. Um, and then on the left, sensories intact up to C4. Okay. And for motor, um, we have three and above is what we're looking for. So C5 on both the right and the left. So I have a question three for you. And above. If, um, so if I would C say C5 for motor. Um, is, and then is the more once proximal you go down past. Is the more oh, proximal? And then the sensory is not intact. That's right. So. Um, so it has to be the level that has. Is your volume on? Oh, can we have one volume on? Mine's on my phone. Yeah, thanks. So. Okay. So motor on the right. You called C5. So it would have to be C3. Okay. With the, with the motor. And on the left? And on the right. And then on the left would be C4. Okay. Are you sure for the motor? No, no, because you asked that question. Um, I mean, for motor, I would say uh, my initial response was C5. On the left, would that be correct? Is the more rostral dermatome intact? The more proximal dermatome is intact. Okay. So then you could call on the left. On the left, level? C4. Or sorry, on the left is C5. Okay. So you had C3 on the right, C5 on the left. Was that correct? C3 on the right, and then C5 on the left. Okay, so your neurological level of injury. What is, what is the most rostral portion that everything is normal, or at least anti-gravity? So the most rostral normal level of injury, or normal um, neurological level would be C3. Okay. Um, and are you calling this complete or incomplete? It's a complete injury because no anal, no voluntary anal contraction or deep anal pressure okay, and so no Asian sacral sensation intact. So Asian impairment scale. A. Excellent. And tell me about sensory zone of partial preservation. Sensory zone of partial preservation would be C5 on the right. And then it would be C5 on the left. And how about motor? Motor would be C6 on the right with one in wrist extensor, uh, extensors and then uh, C6 on the left. All righty, excellent, well done. Yeah, you have to kind of keep working your way through that is the most proximal, um, as you're looking at your motor, if the sensory level is not, uh, not normal, then you have to go at that point. So good job. Kate, oh, and you get to hand off. Who are you going to hand off to? Let me see here. Or you can do the next case if you'd like to. I'll call on, let's see, Rick, Dr. Rosales. Mm. Dr. Rosales. ¿Cómo está hoy? Hola. All right, case three. So first thing I see is we do not have a noon sign. Um, so I know right off the bat it's going to be an incomplete injury. Um, and then for, because we have some deep anal pressure. For sensory, he's intact to T12 bilaterally. Um, uh, for motor on the right, he is 
He's got intact uppers and then nothing on the lowers. Um, so sorry, the sensor level is T12 on both sides. Uh -huh. um, motor level on the right <coughs> is, um, we'll go to T12 um, because we don't have any intact lower extremities. Um, and that's our last normal sensor level. Okay. Um, and on the left will be uh, no anti-gravity on the left, lowers, intact uppers. So we'll go to the last normal sensory T12 again. Okay, so your um, neurological it, level of injury? It would be T12. All right, and is this uh, complete or incomplete? You mentioned it. Incomplete. All righty, so your age and impairment scale. And so he does not have half the muscles below the level of the injury is three or above, so it would be C. Okay, so age impairment scale C. And um, can you report out zone of partial preservation for sensory? No, because, uh, oh, sorry, yes, because he does have deep anal pressure. Um, so can you or so can't? No, you? no, because he, does, uh, because he does have deep anal pressure, so you can't. All righty. And how about mo uh, motor zone of partial preservation on the right? On the right, uh, it would be uh, none. It would just be T12. Okay. And on the left? On the left, it would be L3. Or sorry, L4. Okay. So, excellent, well done. Any questions on this one? You get to hand off to one of your colleagues. We don't have much time, so I'll jump through these next cases relatively quickly. All right, let's go to Dr. McKinty. Dr. McKinty, how are you today? Very quiet. Dr. McKinty, are you gonna join us? I'm supposed to be using my telepathy, I can tell. I'm not that good at this. Can anyone give Dr. McKinty a voice? Or Javier, if he's if Dr. McKinty's not available. Dr. Santana. Dr. Santana. Okay, yeah, I'll give a, a shot at this. All right. So First thing we look at is I could see a noon sign, so automatically I could say that this uh, person is an incomplete. Uh, complete. They have um, an incomplete injury, or complete. Oh, sorry. They or have complete. complete or incomplete. Ha complete, complete. Okay. <laughs> Good. Then from there on, I start working on the sensory. I'm going to look at the right side. So mm -hmm. on the right side, we go all the way to T12. So the sensory levels of T12 on the right side. On the left side, uh, I can see it's also a T12. Though I see some ones, but the more rostral level is a T12. Okay. A not for motor. Sorry, you're saying, Dr. Gator? That motor? Yeah, so motor, um, I would say since there's a T1, it's, it's a 5. Um, I would say motor on the right side is also a T12. Now on the left... It will be a, hmm, wow, this is interesting. Uh, I see a zero and I see a one. And then I also see a two for L2. So I'm going to say, regardless of that, I'm going to take a stab at this. I'm going to say that motor level, motor level on the left side is going to be T12. Okay. So your neurological level of injury? Neurological level of injury is going to be a T12, uh, T12, yes. Okay. Uh, we already said that they're complete. Ancient impairment scale. Oh, I don't know. Like this is this always gets to me. Um, I can never tell. I know that D is normal. A is can be full. So I think this person will be a C. Let's uh, think through that again. If the injury is complete, right, then the Asian impairment scale is an A. An A. Okay. All right, this, I need to work on this. I, uh, the Asian permit scale kind of throws me off. Okay, so there's persons on A in terms of zone of partial preservation. Um, let's start with sensory first. Um, I see none on the left side in terms, uh, sorry, on the right side. On the left side, I would say the zone of partial preservation is all the way to an L4. And finally, let's go for motor partial preservation, um, T12. 
on the right side and on the left side it's going to be a l2 are you asking or telling me l2 i'm going to go over that's my final my final answer final answer all right okay. well well done i think i've used up our time i have several more cases uh, maybe we can do these later in the semester uh, when we have our formal um, spinal cord injury uh, didactics. Um, so hopefully this was helpful. I'm going to jump ahead real quick. Uh, just, you'll see these at some point. Uh, I'm trying to get to my last couple of slides and I think we're out of time. So yes, um, optional testing, we can report, but we don't have to proprioception. Um, and uh, that's for these uh, different uh, extremities. Uh, their ability to appreciate deep pressure in different areas is something that you can report, but it's not required. And you have optional motor testing as well for the diaphragm, deltoids, abdominal muscles, hip adductors, hamstrings, and upper extremities. Um, so that's it. Um, we'll have an opportunity, like I said, to go through this again. I would encourage you to work with each other. Um, as you're finding uh, cases, uh, particularly those on the spinal cord injury rotation, but also I know some of the complex care folks, you're seeing some spinal cord injury patients uh, because of tumors and whatnot. Um, challenge each other on these a little bit. And if you have difficult cases that you're not sure about, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to work with you. Obviously, Dr. DeLaw, Dr. Vivas um, as well. Um, any burning questions before I go? I'm not smelling any burning. So, okay, I'll let you all go. Uh, wonderful day. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and exit out. Everybody have a great day.